Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. I'll invite you to stand with us uh, as we begin to worship this morning. Here at the back of the coffee shop, feel free to make your way forward as we invite the presence of the
Jesus. Um, before we sing this next song, um, I just wanted to share something. Last weekend, uh, me and a bunch of the worship leaders uh, and some of the team here went up to the shoe shop, to this cabin, um, for a songwriting retreat. And the goal was just to spend a couple days to connect with God and connect with each other uh, and, and ask the Lord, what do you have for us? And what do you want us to give to our congregation? What do we want us to sing? How do you want us to praise you better? And we were praying and thinking and sitting by the water and it was such a great time. Um, and I was thinking ahead on the Saturday morning um, in a couple weeks, there's this big youth conference happening here in Kelowna with a few other churches kind of around BC. And I was remembering back when I was a youth student. Um, and there's these moments where you're like, everyone around you is talking about God and how powerful Jesus is. And when you're a kid, sometimes you don't really understand that. Uh, sometimes as an adult, I don't even really understand that. But there was this one moment uh, where I surrendered myself to Jesus. And this profound wave of emotion, uh, the Holy Spirit just hit me like a truck. Uh, and I remember that feeling like it was yesterday. And since then, I've always tried to get that feeling back. And I've asked for the Spirit hit me again because it was just so amazing and so as I was thinking about that moment I wanted to capture that feeling and capture that um, emotional wave of not really understanding what was going on but surrendering my life to Jesus and knowing that no matter what I'm going through I have this new thing I have Jesus in my heart to be with me through the struggles and through the battles and what's going on and so my heart for the song that I wrote for us was that we could remember that moment if you've had that moment in your life where you first encountered Jesus. Uh, and if not, it would be uh, asking for that moment. So I'd like to teach you the chorus here uh, before we start it like this. And Jesus, I love you. Oh, how I love you. You are the one I'm living for, but Jesus, I love you, and oh, how I love you, here in this place, I give you my heart, oh, Jesus, I love you, and oh, how I I love you. 
Yes, God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. He's so present. that you to open our hearts, God, to the sermon that we're about to hear. Make us ready for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. Why don't you go ahead and grab the seat behind you? Why don't we appreciate Canyon and the team this morning? What a... Okay, not all at once. Let's go. <laughs> What a cool thing it is that uh, we have a community that is writing songs uh, from our community for our community, uh, songs that come out of personal experiences that can then become part of meaningful personal experiences for uh, those in our midst. Uh, if you have kids this morning, they can be dismissed off to Treehouse Kids. If you need help figuring out where to send your kids, Morgan and her team up in Treehouse Kids would love to point you in the right direction and get you sorted out. Well, hey, my name's Ryan. Uh, I get to be part-time here on... Part-time here on... I get to be here at the house, uh, part-time, on staff. And uh, on behalf of the rest of the team, we are so excited to have you this morning i uh, glad that we could be a part of your beautiful Sunday, sunny morning. Have, did anyone get outside yesterday? I feel like we've got to lighten it up. Yeah, at least a few of us. Well, hey, I rented a, um, a what's it called? A rototiller. Thank you. That's what it is. I'm not great with machines or mechanical things. A rototiller. Uh, and dug up part of my yard. And th I showed up to Sunbelt Rentals and said, hey, I need to just dig up a few things. And I swear the guy upsold me. I was looking for the, just the, the mini thing. And I loaded up into, this, into my truck this 500-pound monster and wrestled it around my backyard all day. And uh, all that to say, I love the sun. But my body is feeling a little worse for wear this morning. I am getting older. Um, if this is your first time here, we hope more than anything that you feel welcome to, to come as you are, body sores and pains and all, uh, with your life as it is, that you don't have to clean anything up to uh, come before Jesus or be a part of our community. But we really hope that uh, you don't stay as you are, that you might find relationships and community that changes the way that you live and do your life. And so if you have any questions about how to get involved in a community group, on a serve team, or any other ministry here at the church, I encourage you to just stop by the info booth after the service, say hi to our team there, and they'd love to point you in the right direction. Or additionally, one of our pastors would just love and be honored to sit down, go for coffee with you, and, and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, part of my role here at the church is just to, to kind of keep an eye on the bigger picture finance piece of what's going on. And if you live in the business world, you'll know that we just finished Q1 or the first quarter of the year. And so I wanted to give to you a quick little update about where the church is at. Uh, we just want to say thank you so much to those of you who uh, call the house home and who have decided to participate in being generous in our community, believing in what God is doing in our midst. Uh, just a few numbers on the screen for you. Going to start with the donations and total income is 159087. Uh, really, really encouraged by this number. Up 6% year over year. We're trending in the right direction. And um, yeah, woo, yeah, <laughs> hallelujah, praise God, thank you. Um, wanted you to know that that is within just a few thousand dollars of our budgeted amount for this year. And so thank you for giving regularly. Uh, and yeah, I want to remind you that that really makes a difference for us, the team, and our ability to keep doing ministry here. Yeah, you can see our expenses around 180000 uh, really, again, close to where we expected them to be made up of our staffing expenses, our general ministry expense, and then all of the operational things that keep the vans running and the lights on and all the boring stuff. Uh, and so I just wanted to, we wanted to keep you in the loop, and I want to invite you this morning, like we've already mentioned, and like Pastor Chad mentioned last week, to just regular faithful giving. Uh, we, we believe that generosity is something that the Bible calls us to, not just with our finances, but with our entire life, with our emotions, with our time, and with everything in between. And so, um, might God be calling you to participate in generosity in your world in this way? 
Uh, It really is an act of trust, a response to what Jesus is doing in in your life, going, hey, what I have to give is actually what God has already given to me. And um, so I'm going to leave that there. Lots of ways for you to participate, whether that be at the donation station at the back, cash, check, or credit, or debit, uh, online through our website, uh, through e-transfer, and you can even give that Bitcoin that's about to double in the next year. Am I right? Okay. If you have any questions about finances, I want you to know that uh, we want to be transparent. Uh, we really, really value and um, prioritize good stewardship and want to make sure that you feel assured that the places that your money goes is actually having an impact for the kingdom. All right, on a totally unrelated note, want to let you know about YG coming up, big youth conference. Canyon mentioned it uh, just as he was introing this new song this morning. YG is a youth conference that the BC PAOC district puts on each year, and it's being hosted this year at Evangel Kelowna. There's already 800 youth signed up that are coming from all across BC to take part in this. Uh, And registration, early bird registration rather, closes this weekend. And so uh, if you are of youth age, um, that's up to grade 12, want to encourage you to check this weekend out. If you want more information, I think Pastor Matt's going to be hanging out in the foyer after the service. But more than that, uh, if you know, if you aren't of youth age, which I see at least a few faces here that look a little suspicious, um, want you to think about who in your world could you extend this invitation to or ask about it. You might remember that uh, Pastor Chad's testimony actually um, very much began this way, that an older couple in his neighborhood noticed him and said, hey, what if we uh, dragged that kid out to our church? And so they did, and so he came, and uh, he met Jesus because of his elderly neighbors who cared enough to, to take a chance and risk um, inviting him along. And so who might that person be in your life? Uh, It changed Pastor Chad's life and inevitably uh, has changed your life as well as you're sitting here, a part of our community in our church. So this is going to be a great weekend. Uh, If you can't participate in that way, one last ask is that I know that they're always looking for volunteers. And so again, uh, you can send us an email or uh, Dr. Matt after the service about that. We're going to roll a video to get you all jacked up and then Chad's going to come and share the word this morning. Okay, well, that is a great event. We so appreciate uh, the faithfulness, uh, your generosity, allowing us to even have a youth ministry so we can take kids, uh, teens to events like that. And um, it's uh, exciting to see those, uh, those things happen because they are life-changing moments for people. And a number of our uh, pastors and, and uh, team from the church here are going to be helping and supporting that ministry and uh, looking forward to it. It should be a, should be a great weekend. Uh, you may notice that there is a hot tub set up here today, and uh, in case you're wondering, um, that's because Ryan overdid the rototiller, and in between services, he's been taking a tub to kind of loosen up those muscles, and uh, you can, uh, if anybody needs to uh, grab a hot tub after the service, it'll be open for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we, did, we did have um, baptisms planned for today, and uh, the bap- everybody who signed up for baptisms is actually getting baptized tonight. Uh, we usually let people say, what service do you want to get baptized at, and and uh, they all chose for tonight. And so that, is, uh, that will be happening tonight. And uh, those are always great uh, moments in our church. It's one of the unique challenges or nuances, maybe, of being in a church that meets in three different services across a Sunday. And uh, we don't always get to share all of those same experiences. But uh, so glad that you are here with us today. Uh, our new series is called Tipping Points, which describes a shift in momentum or a change in direction. Uh, the idea here is if picture a, a heavy bookshelf that is uh, balanced and sitting where it should, and if you, if you push it forward 
and it gets to a, you know, a certain point, you could maybe begin to let off the pressure and it will want to just settle back to kind of where it needs to be. Uh, but if you keep going and you keep pushing, it will eventually get to the place where it's going to want to fall forward into the other direction. And that really is the tipping point. It's that moment from shifting momentum from one area or one direction to another. And our series on uh, this idea of tipping points focuses on key events and characters that shifted the momentum and direction of Israel, of the early church, and, and still, to, to a, a large effect, they are still impacting and, and shifting our lives today as we continue to try to follow Jesus. Uh, we all have tipping points in our life story, key moments, uh, significant experiences, changes that we've, that we've gone through that shape who we are and shape our life. Maybe uh, moving out of the house for the first time, maybe getting out on your own, living on your own for the first time was a, a tipping point for you. Maybe graduating from university and starting out in what uh, adults like to call the, the real world, you know, on your own and getting started with those kinds of things. Maybe uh, buying your first new car or uh, buying your first house or condo and what that was like, or maybe meeting that, that person, that special someone, wondering, could they be the one? And, uh, and then going through all of that process and all the butterflies and beginning a relationship and dating and maybe proposing and getting engaged and, and maybe getting married. And, and then there's kids and other things that come along. Maybe that's, maybe that's the, 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 the tipping point for you and the shifting momentum place of your life. Uh, maybe you haven't experienced all those things in life yet, but uh, life is full of blessings and milestone moments that really change us and really make us who we are today. But not all tipping points are positive. And we know this, that some of us have been marked by some challenging and some difficult experiences in our story. Some of you have had a marriage fall apart and know the, know the pain and the sorrow and the heartache and all that goes along with that. Maybe you've experienced a breakdown in a key family relationship. Maybe you're estranged from one of your kids or there's just been some, some division in your family. Maybe you've lost your job or, or, or maybe lost some money in an investment or your business went belly up, went bankrupt. You had to close things down and you lost everything. Uh, maybe it's a health scare or a bad diagnosis that you got that turned everything in your world upside down. And we know that uh, tipping points that come can be positive or negative, and sometimes they're a complex combination between the two. But these are the moments and the experiences that make us who we are. And so with that in mind today, I want to take a look at our text in Genesis 3. This is the story of the, of the fall, of uh, the first sin, and uh, it's, a, it's a story that I think many people are acquainted with, but to give context today, I think it's really important to just read the Word and take a look and, and let the Word of God speak to us, because that's primarily how uh, the Spirit of God continues to speak to the church today. And so from Genesis 3, it says this. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced, and she saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband, who was there with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking among the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked, the Lord asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, it was the woman and you gave me and, and, and she gave me the fruit and I ate it. And the Lord asked the woman, what have you done? 
The serpent deceived me, she replied, and that's why I ate. Now, the story goes on in in Genesis 3 to uh, bring about God's response to what's taken place. He announces some of the judgments and the consequences, some of the fallout of what has happened. And um, there's a lot of details in the story. It's, It's possible to maybe get bogged down in some questions on the story. Like, did the serpent really speak in like a language that Adam and Eve were speaking and that he understood? Um... Did God walk in the garden in, in like a human bodily form and just have this face-to-face conversation with Adam and Eve? What, what did that look like if he's really spirit? And, and, and there's, lots of, there's lots of questions that we can think of. And you know, there's lots of really good answers. There's lots of good theolo- uh, theological research and academia that has been done along those kinds of questions. They're not without merit. But for the context of what I want to talk about today and how this relates to the tipping points and, and the significant moments in our history of God's people, Uh, I want to look at the bigger overarching spiritual themes and the spiritual lessons that are contained within this story. Uh, And it starts with this idea that there's there's positive and negative tipping points. And so I want to start with the bad news first today, okay? Uh, And that is this idea, it's, it's the negative. It's this question, what have you done? God comes to Adam and Eve and he says, what have you done? It's very important to remember that Adam and Eve represent all of humanity, and their actions in the garden impact all of us even today. Their sin breaks something in the cosmos, something, there's the balance of the, of the cosmos is shifted, is broken in their actions and what they do. It's not just eating an apple. This is a tipping point because this is how sin enters into the human story. And this is why God asks that weighted question. What did you do? What have you done? And it comes with this level, this magnitude, the gravity of the situation. And this story contains some timeless truths in understanding the subtleties of temptation and the destructive power of sin in our lives. You see, the serpent personifies temptation. And he's described as crafty and shrewd. In fact, in the, in the Hebrew, the, the word that is used is literally translated as cunning. The serpent is cunning. He's crafty. He's shrewd. He comes as a trickster. Uh, a number of years ago, Angela and I were enjoying, enjoying a, a very fine lunch in the front window of a Home Depot eating our Harvey's hamburgers. And uh, if you remember those days. And uh, we were sitting there having this great lunch together on a nice Saturday. And uh, maybe not unlike yesterday, but in the spring, it was like a beautiful time of year. And um, we noticed at the end of the counter, at the end of the bar that we were having our lunch at, was a, a, a raffle box, a free draw for a trip for two to Hawaii for a week. And we thought, well, we should fill that out. So we filled out the ballots and, and you know, folded them over and tucked them into the, into the ballot box and never thought much of it. And um, a few days later, we were quite surprised to uh, get a call that we had won a free trip for two to Hawaii. And uh, that was like, wow, this is pretty cool. This is amazing. And we looked forward to it all week. They had said, you know, you, you, you got to come down and claim your prize in person. Saturday morning, 10 a.m., they gave us the address and the location. It was a marketing business downtown. And we thought, oh, this is so cool. And, and so um, we, we uh, got up that morning, went downtown, uh, found the address, went, went, into the, went through the door, got into the, the kind of the lobby, the reception area, and we were quite startled to find there were a whole bunch of other couples there ready to claim their prize as well. And, um, and then something very strange happened. An airplane pilot, like a, like a, like a, like a uniform, the whole thing, the hat, the, came out, and he says, welcome, everybody. Uh, if you would just come with us, we've just got a short presentation for you. And I thought, this is a little strange. And so we all went into this side room, and it was set up as the inside of an airplane in rows of three. And, um, and so we all went in. They said, please grab a seat. And, uh, and I thought, this is like, what is going on? And I said, I just came here to get my, get my prize. You know? And they said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll hand out the prizes at the end. We just need to go through this, uh, this short presentation for everybody. So I sat down with Ange, and uh, another person sat down next to us. 
and realized as they closed the door to the airplane and we were about to take off that this was a bait and switch timeshare pitch, uh, a, a scam. And so uh, there I sat with my arms folded, quite upset and quite angry. That all, I, I, I decided, well, you know what, I'll, I'll wait to the end so I can get my prize. I mean, what is it? It's just a, it's a trip to Hawaii. You don't get those very often. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll take the bullet and we'll sit there. And they began in their presentation and their pitch. And um, I knew that I wasn't going to sign up for a timeshare. Uh, I knew that this is like the last thing that I was going to do. But I sat there and I began to listen to their presentation. And, and it, was, it was actually pretty good. You know, you start thinking, oh, yeah, this is, this, this, I, I do deserve a holiday. I do deserve a timeshare. I, this, yeah, you know what? It is affordable. It, is, it does kind of. And they start presenting all the stuff and all the angles. And I'm pretty sure that in our row of three next to Angela and myself, the person next to us was a plant from the operation because they kept going like this. We going, isn't that amazing? Isn't that a great deal? And then, and then they say, like, this is like a one-time only offer, limited time. It's going to go public in a month. And, you know, you were at the top of the list. And, and oh, isn't that amazing? And, and all of a sudden, you start thinking, like, actually, this is a pretty good deal. And uh, you start considering and you start thinking about something and making a decision on something you never, ever, ever had uh, the intent on making a decision on. And then at the end of the presentation... It closes with a high pressure pitch to put down a non-refundable deposit for $6,000 to secure your spot in this once-in-a-lifetime offer. And I knew that a uh, timeshare in Hawaii was not really going to be a regular part of my life. And I firmly declined their offer and informed them that uh, we were leaving now and I wanted my prize. And um, their very pleasant demeanor quickly shifted and became a little bit more cold. And instead of being handed two tickets to Hawaii, they opened yet another door. And I went in, and here was a large game show prize wheel. And on one of the slots, it said, trip for two to Hawaii. And there was a whole bunch of other uh, things on it. And I discovered that the fine print was a chance to win a trip for two to Hawaii. And so I spun the wheel, praying to Jesus to bless me with that prize to Hawaii <laughs> with all spiritual faith and fervor and passion. And I spun the wheel and a did -did 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 price is right. It was going around and around. And then it finally stopped. And I went home with a free barbecue utensil set <laughs> worth about $15. <laughs> I was so mad. How could I be so stupid? And I wasted half of my Saturday morning, my only day off with Ange for this cheap Chinese knockoff uh, barbecue utensil, mass made kind of, it probably ended up in the dumpster right away. And um, I was so mad that I'd been taken advantage of. And I, how could I be so dumb? And I felt so bad for the people because as we left, there were people pulling out their wallets and filling out paperwork at tables all around. And uh, I know that there were a lot of people that day that were going to leave with some serious buyer's regret. The entire operation was this fine oiled machine packaged in half truths designed to get you roped in, hooked in, designed to trap you into making a decision you normally wouldn't make. And they were so good at it. They were schooled in psychology, in sales, and how to manipulate people. They knew exactly what to say and how to say it. And I know that they duped a lot of people that day. And scripture identifies the devil as the father of lies. He's an imposter who deals in subtleties and lies and half-truths. He's cunning and deceptive. He's shrewd. He knows just what to say and how to say it. And he will do whatever it takes and be as subtle and as sly just to kind of make his way in, to get into our head, to get into our life, to begin to whisper more, to begin to lead us more and more astray. Did God really say? Did God really mean you shouldn't eat it? Certainly you won't die. Look how good it is. You know, the same things that he said to Adam and Eve are still the same things that he says to us today. It's beautiful and delicious and you're hungry. 
Why would God create it if he didn't want you to have it? Just have a little bit. No one else will know. What will it hurt? You deserve it. And that is the same cycle of temptation used on the church today. Did God really mean not to take that extended gaze or indulge in the odd lustful thought? What does it hurt? No one knows. Certainly, pornography is not the same thing as having an affair. Did God really mean sexual intimacy is reserved only for a husband and wife and no other parameters, no other kinds of relationships or connection? It's 2024. Surely not all of that still matters. Isn't love and respect and commitment between two consenting adults more important than just some important piece or some uh, piece of paper? You see, the enemy always comes in the same way. He comes in half-truths. He comes shrewd and crafty and cunning. And before you know it, you've accepted a lie. Before you know it, you've opened your heart to small compromises, small thoughts, small steps away from Jesus. And the lie becomes a belief, and the belief becomes an act. And the moment they sin, they feel shame about their nakedness, and they immediately cover up and hide. They hide from one another. They hide from God. They try to cover up. They feel this immense level of shame upon them. You see, sin destroys relationship with self, relationship with another, with others, and relationship with God. Sin always hurts us. This is the destruction. This is the outcome. This is always where it finishes. This is always the end goal of the enemy. And this is a tipping point because Adam and Eve represent all of humanity. And this is how sin enters our human story. Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, Death came to all people because all sinned. When Adam and Eve make this decision, when God says, what have you done? It highlights the significance of this tipping point moment that forever changes humanity's relationship with God. And now we have this division, this distance, this separation. Well, the good news is that that is not the end of the story because God asks another question in this story. And this is the positive tipping point where God comes and he says, where are you? Where are you, Adam? Where are you, Eve? He comes looking for them. In verse eight, the scriptures say, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking among the garden, so they hid from the Lord among the trees. And verse nine says, and then the Lord God came and called to them, where are you? are you? This is my favorite part of the whole story because this is the good news part of the story. This question represents the positive tipping point in God's story with humanity. It, God doesn't shake his head in disappointment and disgust. God doesn't leave Adam and Eve where they are hiding in their shame. He doesn't reject them. He comes looking for them. He wants to restore relationship. He wants to repair that which became broken. He wants to give back that which was stolen. Jesus came to bring abundant life. The enemy came to rob, steal, and destroy. God came to reconcile. He came calling, where are you? There is great power and profound significance in those three words, where are you? One of the commentators I read this week uh, said this in, 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 in one of his uh, writings, one of his articles, and I, I thought it was worth sharing, said this, the entire Bible can be summed up in God coming to us and asking the question, where are you? That's the story of God in humanity. 
That's what God is doing. He's coming to us, and he's continually seeking us out, and he's continually asking, where are you? Come to me. Come out of hiding. Come out of your shame. Come to me. This is one of the hardest spiritual truths for us to learn because it's so easy to believe God is disappointed and angry with us. It's so easy to believe I'm beyond God's reach. I've exhausted all of his grace. It's so easy to hide away in the bushes with nothing but our shame, believing God doesn't want us. Church, if you only hear one thing today, may it be the voice of the good shepherd standing in front of you, saying, where are you? Come to me. Let the power and significance of those three words rest heavily on your soul. God has not given up on you. Yes, sin has entered the world. Sin has entered the story of humanity. It wreaks havoc on our life. But the Lord doesn't leave us hiding in the bushes. God looking for Adam and Eve in the garden is a precursor to Jesus. In Luke 19.10, Jesus says this, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That is the ministry and the mission of Jesus. He came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to say to us, to call us out, where are you? He came looking for us. And you know, we see a common thread right from the very beginning of this encounter with creation. Right in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 3, and what happens, in how they, they fall away and they sin and they're duped by the devil and they give in to their deception and they go their own way and they struggle in sin and it creates division and God comes and he says, let me restore you. Where are you? And he calls out to seek them. He calls out to set them free. And we see a common thread from that point in Scripture all the way through Scripture of God's redemption, of God calling us, of God providing a way out. And it finishes all the way with Jesus on the cross. And this detail and that part is not lost in this story. In Genesis 3, God spills the blood of an animal and makes clothing out of the skin to cover up Adam and Eve. He calls them out from behind the bushes that they're hiding from and he covers them and he takes away their shame. Well, the covering of that first blood sacrifice in Genesis 3 is a foreshadow of Jesus on the cross. Jesus comes looking for us and he calls us out of our sin and our shame. He doesn't give up on us. Instead, he takes away our sin. He covers us up in his forgiveness. That which was provided by his own blood shed on the cross. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he's calling each one of us. What sin are you hiding behind? What is the Lord calling you out of? Today is a good opportunity to answer Jesus' call, to step out of that sin that so easily ensnares, to step out of that thing that you're hiding behind, to receive his forgiveness, his covering, and his blessing. You know, it's very possible that you're here today and maybe you've never opened your heart to Jesus. Maybe you wouldn't consider yourself or call yourself a Christian. Maybe that's just something totally far from the way you've been thinking. Maybe you have a, a, a different belief, a different kind of faith system. Maybe you're agnostic or atheist or there's just like, it's just, it's shut off. That idea of spirituality just hasn't really existed in your life. It's very possible 
than in a room like this today that you've come in and you are very, very far from God. And could it be that today this is Jesus saying to you, where are you? Where have you been? Where have you been hiding? Come to me. Step into my love and my forgiveness. Trust in me. Put your hope in me. Let me put my blessing and my covering over your life. Let me restore that which was broken. In fact, there's a word that we have in Scripture called salvation. And salvation is literally interpreted as healing and being made whole. To come to Jesus, to say, Jesus, I'm here. I don't want to hide on my own. I don't want to try to do this on my own. I want to put my hope and my trust in you. To do that is to take a step, say, Jesus, forgive me. Wash away my sin, my shortcomings. Heal my hurts, my habits, and my hangups. And help me to find you. It's also possible that you're here today and it feels more like you've been distant from God. It feels more like there's been a divide. Something's been pushing you away from his presence, from the closeness of his voice, from fellowship with him, from peace with him. Maybe faith in Jesus has been a very big part of your life, a significant part of who you are, but you've been feeling like it's just been harder and harder to connect with him. It might be because of distractions and focusing on other things. It might be because of entertaining sin and, and, and getting too welcome and too comfortable with a sin in your heart and in your life. Jesus is looking for you. Jesus is saying, where are you? Where have you been? Come to me. Come out from your hiding. Come out from that thing that has been blocking connection with me. Let me forgive you. Let me cover you. Let me give you grace and mercy and set you free. Let me give you that embrace. And there's an opportunity for you today to answer that call to Christ, to make that, that fresh invitation to connect to him. I wonder if we close in this moment, would you please bow your heads, close your eyes in a moment of prayer? This morning in our first service, we had a young man who came up after the service. And he said, I've only been in church twice. But I know that you are talking to me today. And I was able to lead him in a prayer at the end of the service. Open his heart to Jesus for the very first time. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here today. And this is the first time for you to open your heart and say, Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me. Fill that space in my heart with you, with your love, with your goodness. Jesus would stand right in front of you today and he'd say, where are you? I came looking for you because I love you with an everlasting love. Would you reach out to Jesus today? Would you take that step? And for the rest of us, maybe it just feels like there's been some distance. And it could be distractions. It could be the pace of life. It could be because you've gotten comfortable and maybe even spiritually lazy. Maybe you've just welcomed some things from the world too close to your heart. Whatever that is, it's like there's a distance between you and God. In fact, it feels like you've been hiding from him. And to know today that Jesus loves you with an everlasting love and he wants more than anything to restore that which has been taken, to restore relationship and connection with you. If it feels like you've been more distant than close to God, if it feels like there's been something creating a division in your connection with God, would you give that up today? In fact, I'm going to ask you in this moment to just slip your hand up and put it back down to say, yep, that's me. I've been far from God and I just need to do some business with him. 
You bring that thing, you bring that hurt, that sin, that distraction. Bring that to Jesus and say, here it is, Jesus, it's me. I give it to you. Would you step out today from behind the bushes and answer Jesus' call? He is full of love and grace and mercy for you. And Jesus, we pray for those today, those that are here in this room. This is a sacred moment. And Jesus, we pray for those that may be here today and they've never made that declaration of faith in you. May they make that today to open their heart to you. And I pray for those that would say it's been, it's been difficult. I feel a distance. I feel a disconnect with you. Jesus, would you restore them? Would you forgive them? Would you empower them? Place your presence and your love and your grace on their life and whatever that sin, whatever that disconnect is, would you just take it away? Lord, would you bring your forgiveness as white as snow? Would you set us free so that we can grab your hand and step out from behind those things we've been hiding and come to you? In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that we often do as we close is uh, have a time to kind of sing together, do a, do a song as a little bit of a response, kind of seal some of the themes. And uh, the team's prepared a, a great song, which is really a prayer response to Jesus and uh, follows some of these themes today. And so as we close in the final minute together, uh, I invite you, why don't you stand if you're able to, uh, stretch your legs, you've been sitting for a while, appreciate you for listening this morning. And... Uh, why don't we focus in and, and prayer, uh, make this a, a song of prayer from our heart. This is an opportunity for you to reconnect with Jesus in this moment. So take that step and uh, we'll close in just a minute.
Well, we serve a God that is filled with everlasting love, grace, and mercy for us, who is always calling us, always looking for us, always willing to welcome us. And so I trust that you'll be encouraged today and you will be able to take a step into his grace and his forgiveness, able to restore connection with Jesus this week, and that you will wake up knowing that he is there saying, where are you? Where have you been? Let's do this day together. And may Christ's presence fill your heart with encouragement as you walk with him this week ahead. If you would like someone to pray with you today, it would be our honor to be able to spend a few minutes in prayer. Uh, we will dismiss in just a second, but our prayer team will be here. Maybe you want someone to pray with you. Maybe you've been struggling and in some sin. Maybe it just feels like there's been a disconnect with you and God and you just want to kind of make things right or feel something close to him again. Uh, we want to pray for you today and uh, encourage you and restore you today in your faith. Maybe you're here and you've never made that prayer before. You've never made that step of faith before. We'd be happy to chat with you for a minute, get you a Bible, talk to you about what that looks like. You can come as well. And uh, the rest of us, we're going to be dismissed. And uh, we trust that you'll have a week ahead in God's presence. If we don't see you before, we will see you next Sunday.